If you're in the market for a spacious, comfortable and affordable plug-in hybrid SUV, is the MG HS a good option? Let's put it to the test to find out. The MG HS SUV launched on UK roads in late 2019 in combustion powered form and was offered as a larger, more family friendly alternative to the ZS, the brand's best selling model. A year later, this HS plug-in hybrid version was introduced to the lineup, the brand's first plug-in hybrid model. So how does it stack up against rivals like the Ford Cougar, Peugeot 5008 and the Kia Sportage? Does it do anything special that makes it stand out in this highly competitive segment? And if you're after a new family or business car, is this worth considering? Before we find out, you can click up there to head over to the OSV website and check out the latest and hottest lease deals on the MG HS plug-in hybrid. And do subscribe to keep up to date with our in-depth car reviews. According to MG, the HS was designed to look purposeful, sporty, and perfectly at home on British roads. Did it achieve that? Well, I think it looks a bit too similar to other large SUVs on the market, but there's some exterior features to highlight here. I like the field grille, as MG calls it, with the octagonal MG badge displayed prominently in the centre. I enjoy the bold creases on the bonnet and the chrome strips wrapped around the grille and the daytime running lights. But apart from that, the overall look is a bit boring, especially when compared to the Peugeot 5008 and the Kia Sportage, which boast much more bolder and distinctive exterior designs. Down here, we have 18 inch Hurricane aluminium alloy wheels. So the only wheel size you can get with the HS plug-in hybrid. And the side profile adopts this smooth and flowy look to it, complemented by chrome highlights on the door handles, roof rail, and side sills. The standard body colour depends on the variant you've opted for. If you go with the petrol you get arctic white and with plug-in hybrid this is white pell. There's loads of metallic paints on offer for £545 and this is one of them, Farringdon Red. Taking a look at the dimensions, it comes in at 4,754 millimetres in length, so it's longer than the Ford Cougar and the Peugeot 5008. It's about as wide as the Cougar though, and high as the 5008, so it's very similar in size to other large SUVs available. There's nothing too exciting about the design of the rear end, but I enjoy how the rear tail lights merge around onto the tailgate, and with the top spec exclusive model, the these have sequential indicators. You also get an aluminium rear bumper and twin tailpipes, and you can add a tow bar as an optional add-on because this car has a 1,500 kilogram braked towing capacity suitable for pulling trailers and small caravans. Let's take a closer look at the boot space on offer. With the petrol powered version of the HS, you get a 463 litre capacity. That's more than the 412 litres offered by the Ford Cougar, but not as cavernous as the Peugeot 5008's 512 litre luggage space. However, if you opt for the plug-in hybrid version like we have, you get a 448 litre capacity. So just a slight reduction there, but it does make the difference. This is enough room for three to four of these smaller carry-on suitcases but as you can see the loading lip here is very high so you're gonna have to really lug those heavy shopping bags into the back it fits rather nice and snug though that translates to around two to three larger adult suitcases. You may have spotted that the charging cables like with the MG5 EV are once again in a bag and there's no dedicated storage space for these. But we do have some underfloor storage where you'll find a spot for the rapid charging cable and all the maintenance tools. And there's some empty compartments there to put some objects out of the way of prying eyes. Sadly, there's no hooks to tie objects down or netted compartments 
to put objects that like to roll around. It's a pretty basic boot space, but we can fold down the seats from here to extend the boot capacity further. With the plug-in hybrid version, it gives you around 1,375 litres, and with the petrol version, it's around 1,450. Just use the levers on either side there, push them up. They require a bit of welly because they lock, and then push them down. There we go. They're not spring-loaded either, so they do require a bit of force, but they fly down like so, and then they lock in place. So this is enough room for an adult's bike. I, in fact, fit my gravel bike in here without taking the wheel off. I also put my flatmate's mattress in the back here, and it fit absolutely fine. Unlike the MG5, it is completely flat with the floor. If you want to find out more about the boot space with that electric car, click the pop-out banner above. And yes, it's all locked in place, so it won't be flapping around or moving around while on the go. Okay, guys, if you also want to fit your mattress and gravel bike into the back of your perfect MGHS FEV, then give our team a call on the number below and we'll help you find your perfect specification. So, how does this car drive on UK roads? It's time to get behind the wheel. Okay guys, MG has kept the HS line up here nice and simple. There's just two drivetrain options and two trim levels. We'll dive into those in a bit more detail later on in the review. There's no diesel or four-wheel drive option, but this car didn't really need it. So what we have here is the 1.5 litre TGDI plug-in hybrid powertrain. That comprises a 254 horsepower turbo petrol engine and a 90 kilowatt electric motor and that's mated to a 16.6 .6 kilowatt hour battery pack. This pack is recharged via regen braking and by the petrol engine and of course you can plug it in at your home wall box or a plug socket or a rapid charger that you'll find at a service station stop or supermarket car park. This unit develops 273 newton meters of torque and that's plenty of oomph to get this rather bulky SUV up to speed on an A road or motorway. Thankfully the small battery weighs only around 1,800 kilograms so it doesn't weigh the car down too much and as a result it feels surprisingly nimble. Indeed it can do 0 to 62 in 6.9 seconds so that's quicker than the Ford Cougar plug-in hybrid and it's great because it's quite an easy SUV to nip into and out of tight gaps around town. The only transmission option available with this plug-in hybrid drivetrain is 10-speed auto. This sends power to the front wheels and works in tandem with the electric motor and the petrol engine to enhance fuel efficiency. MG's fuel economy figures for this car are pretty generous to say the least. It says you can achieve up to 156 mpg on the combined cycle. However, this is pretty unrealistic unless you plan on running purely off that small battery pack. The trip computer now says that I'm averaging 46.8 miles per gallon, which isn't fantastic for a plug-in hybrid car, especially when you consider conventional petrol options can achieve in excess of 50 mpg. CO2 emissions are pretty good for this model. It outputs around 43 grams per kilometer of CO2, and that places this car in the 12% benefit in kind band for 2022 to 2023. So this car is a pretty good company car option. Let's talk about the EV mode, which when pressed will allow you to run this car purely off the power stored in the battery pack. When enabled, it can do a top speed of up to 81 miles per hour, and it can achieve a maximum driving range of 32 miles. So that's not as much as the 35 mile range offered by the Ford Cougar plug-in hybrid, but it should be more than enough, or potentially, to cover your daily commute, quick trips around town, and your weekly grocery shop. MG also quote a city driving range of 43 miles, but this is in the most ideal conditions possible and you'll likely be driving this car extremely slowly through town. But it's great to see that you could witness figures in excess of 40 miles um, if you own this car in a congested city. Charging is a pretty bog standard affair for a plug-in hybrid. If you plug it into a three pin domestic plug, it will do a zero to 100% charge in around seven hours, it's not too bad at all. If you need it to charge faster, plug it into a seven kilowatt wall box and it'll do that charge in three hours. So just remember to plug it in when you get home for work and it'll be more than topped up for you, ready for the next day.
The hybrid version is certainly more animated than its conventional petrol equivalent. This is the same 1.5 litre TGDI unit, but it outputs 159 horsepower and 250 newton meters of torque for a slightly more sluggish 0 to 62 time of 9.6 seconds, but that's still quite impressive for a large SUV. MG's claims fuel economy figures are a little bit worse as well. You can achieve up to 37.3 mpg on the combined cycle. That's a lot less than you'll get with equivalent rivals like the 1.2 litre PureTech engine under the bonnet of the Peugeot 5008. CO2 emissions unfortunately are quite high as well, 172 grams per kilometre. That places this version of the MG HS in the highest 37% company car tax band. So if you are after a new company car guy, and you want to go with MG for the affordability, definitely look more towards the plug-in hybrid variant that we have for review. One benefit of going with the pure petrol option though is with the seven speed DCT transmission, you get three different driving modes. These are pretty familiar guys. It's eco, normal and sport, but you don't get these at all with the plug-in hybrid variant. I'm not really too sure why that's the case, but it is a shame and it does have an impact on the driving experience here. The ride quality is more leisurely than dynamic. If you want an engaging drive out of your MG HS plug-in hybrid, you will need to look elsewhere. As with the MG5 EV though, this car does a surprisingly good job at absorbing the impact of humps and potholes around town, especially at lower speeds. At higher speeds, those lighter abrasions are nicely absorbed as well, but those more substantial impacts like a manhole cover poking out from the road surface send a thump throughout the cabin, disrupting the rigidity of the body structure. I have issues with the steering. The leisurely ride quality feels at odds with the weighted setup the HS plug-in hybrid provides. This would be fine for a sporty SUV, but here it just feels a little bit out of place. MG should have opted for a lighter setup and that would have made this bulky SUV much easier to maneuver around town and into and out of those tight parking gaps. Even with the standard rear view camera, it can be quite tricky to gauge the size of this car and it's certainly something that will take quite a bit of time to get used to. Yeah, the HS plug-in hybrid just doesn't handle as nicely as the Ford Cougar Fev. It doesn't grip to the road as confidently and there's quite a bit of body lean when you go around corners due to the large batteries under the floor. I'll often find myself over by the window so the side cushions could definitely do a better job at holding you in place. I'll talk about the pedals briefly. The accelerator gives a nice bit of feedback so it's easy to gauge how much power you're giving the car but the brake is far too soft and it's an issue I had with the MG5 EV. I imagine this is the case because this car has regen braking so when you lift up on the accelerator it starts to slow down a lot faster than it would with a conventional petrol powered equivalent so they made the brakes soft as a result but it just doesn't feel great and I would like it to be firmer. The HS plug-in hybrid is very quiet compared to conventional combustion powered models but in comparison to other FEVs on the market it is a fair bit louder. At lower speeds you'll notice a whine coming from the electric motors but in all honesty I quite like this sound. At speeds above 30 miles an hour when it's switching between the electric motors and the petrol engine you will notice this happening because a coarse sound reverberates throughout the cabin disrupting the other relaxing driving experience that this car provides. There's an uncomfortable amount of resistance when this switch occurs. The car hesitates for a couple of seconds and when it has fully switched over to the petrol engine it will jut forward which suggests a lack of refinement on MG's end. On the bright side road noise and wind noise is pretty minimal. Despite the large alloy wheels they do a pretty good job at smoothing out any undulations and I haven't heard any bellowing coming from the mirrors or the windscreen especially at higher speeds. Due to shortcomings with the driver's seat adjustability, which I'll address in the next section, you always have a perched and lofty position of the road ahead. You can clearly see over the bonnet and aim the car directly down the road. You get slim side pillars and they don't create too much of a blind spot at junctions and the mirrors are nice and large. The view out the back is okay, though if you have three rear passengers, you've got no hope in hell of seeing out the back of that. And my over the shoulder view isn't too bad. The rear pillars are quite chunky, but you do 
get quarter glass to remedy this. My biggest issue is with the low mounted rear view mirror, which obscures my view of the left hand side of the windscreen. Unlike the MG5 EV, there's no ambiguity around the safety credentials of the HS plug-in hybrid, as it's been awarded the maximum five stars for safety by Euro NCAP, meeting the standard set by the ZS sibling. This is because the MG Pilot Pack now comes as standard. This is an advanced suite of driver aids that includes features like autonomous emergency braking, adaptive cruise control, lane keep assist, rear cross traffic alert, and blind spot monitoring, just to name a few. A huge advantage of choosing MG over other brands is its pretty impressive warranty. Seven years or 80,000 miles, whichever comes first. You also get seven years of anti-perforation and three years of paint protection, plus access to MG's authorized repair network via its service plan. It may not be as impressive as Hyundai and Kia's warranties, but it is one of the best offered by a manufacturer in the UK. Unfortunately, the infotainment setup inside the cabin here leaves a lot to be desired. So I'm gonna pull over and we'll explore that in more detail. As standard with the HS plug-in hybrid, you get a rear parking camera, which we'll demonstrate to you right now. It's not the highest res display in the world and it's pretty useless at night and on rainy days, but it does an okay job at guiding you into a tight space, as you can see. And on the left-hand side there, we've got a bird's eye view of the car, which is helpful for when maneuvering. Due to the 360 nature of this camera, the cameras activate when you're near a curb at a junction and that helps you avoid marking alloys. That's a great feature. When it comes to the interior, MG's designers prioritize comfort and quality above all else. And like the MG5 EV, it's not exactly a luxurious cabin, but there's a great use of soft touch materials throughout. And if you're upgrading from the ZS, there's an awful lot to like here. I like the design of these piano key buttons for the infotainment system, but they're not particularly functional. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. Cool turbine-like design for the air vents. You get a chrome effect trim on the cubby hole lid and the center console plus a faux lever effect on the dash and doors great use of materials there's plenty of space up front if you're six foot or over headroom is good so i'm five eight and i'm miles away from that roof lining we even have the sunroof open with this exclusive trim model it's worth bearing this in mind guys because it may affect the comfort of your rear passengers since it trims a couple of centimeters off that roof lining legroom is good you can adjust the seat to recline backwards like so if you like to get a nice comfortable position stretch your legs out and there's ample knee and elbow room so you won't be knocking shoulders with your other front passenger those spaces are nicely compartmentalized the seats in the entry level model are incredibly well specced they're electrically adjustable they've got lumbar support perfect for those longer journeys and they're heated as well my only complaint is that they don't come down low enough i'll just demonstrate that you still get a lofty driving position in this low seat setting that's not going to be for everybody. The steering wheel is wrapped in nice grippy perforated leather and I like the red stitching. The buttons are satisfying to press as well. Behind the steering wheel we have a 12.1 inch driver display. The graphics on this are rather cheesy but I'm a fan. And it shows all your key information such as how much charge is left in that tiny battery, how much fuel you've got left in the tank and how many miles it estimates uh, that you've got left in total. Accompanying this is a large 10.1 inch color touchscreen with all the usual gubbins, DAB radio, Bluetooth, a sat nav, a six speaker sound system, and Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Worth bearing in mind this is a wired connection as it is with the MG5 EV, though it doesn't look as messy when you've got the wire plugged in and everything sorted out because of this compartment in the center console where you can lie your smartphone down like so. And if it's nice and nice and snug in there, you still got the wire wrapped around the gear selector, but unfortunately that's a sacrifice you have to make. I'm disappointed with the infotainment system. The interface looks like it was designed in Microsoft Paint, but at least the icons are large and easy to see while driving along. And all the essential options are displayed very clearly on this single home page. Plus the screen itself is larger or higher up on the dashboard than it is inside the MG5 EV. And that's a complaint I had with that car. Unfortunately, 
that's where the positives end. For some reason, the screen is angled slightly away from the driver. That's the first time I've encountered that. It makes it quite difficult to see some of the options, especially on a sunny day like today where it attracts lots of glare and those options are fading out somewhat. And trying to select stuff on the far left-hand side of the screen when driving along is pretty tricky. You have to lean over like so. Inputs can take upwards of five seconds or so to register far too long, especially egregious if you want to access the climate controls. You have to press a button down here, it's one of the piano keys, press that, it eventually loads and trying to adjust any of this stuff, stuff just takes far too long. It's very laggy, unresponsive and the heated seat functions are incorporated into this as well. It's just an unnecessary faff and it takes your eyes away from the road for far too long. There's also far too many button presses required to get to where you want to get to. So say for example I've got a route map from A to B and I want to get to the radio. Well there's no option up here to go there via this screen. I have to click the home button down there and for some reason that's not the center button it's the third from the left and then I have to go to the radio. Too many button presses for a screen which you're not really meant to be using while driving along. Unlike touch sensitive displays you'll find in equivalent rivals this screen doesn't have haptic feedback so it's difficult to determine when your inputs have been registered and these piano buttons are not very functional because you just put them down you can't flick them up. It makes sense to adjust the volume up by flicking up but it's not the case here. I know that's a nitpick I just would prefer these to be dials like you find in pretty much every other car. That's enough moaning, let's talk about the cubby holes. So underneath the piano key buttons, we have a small compartment for your phone. It might be a bit of a tight squeeze if you've got a larger device. This also has a USB port and a 12 volt socket. Behind that, we have a couple of cup holders, one big and one small. The bigger one easily fits my large bulky bottle, nice and snug. The smaller one's the perfect place for your keys. It also has a divider, so you can adjust the size of those spaces as you please. And then we've got that smaller compartment, perfect for your smartphone when you connect it up via Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. There's a centre compartment as well, if we lift that up, the space is pretty deep and cavernous, perfect for sweets. Look at how much space is in this glove box, very impressive, you can cram lots of objects in there. Door bins are nice and spacious, easily fitting my bulky bottle if there's no other place for it. And you've got another storage compartment on the doors themselves, that would be a good place for your keys. So I said earlier that the panoramic sunroof could compromise headroom in the back, so let's go double check that. The HS Fev offers a good amount of rear passenger space for a vehicle of this class. Due to the batteries under the floor, you can see my knees are quite high up, but that's not creating any kind of discomfort, and I can stretch my legs out really far, very comfortable. Headroom, it's actually pretty good. So again, I'm 5'8", I'm miles away from the roof lining. Taller passengers might just be grazing the top there with this panoramic sunroof equipped, but you can recline this bench in the same way that you would uh, to fold the seats down fully. Just tug on that lever, push it back, and that's nice when you're stopping off at a service station and you can recline a little bit and relax and you get a good view out that sunroof as well. In front of me, I've got a nicely sized pouch, perfect for magazines and an iPad. And it's good to see that the lever effect trim continues into the back here. The door bins are a bit thinner than they are in the front. Let's just see if they fit my bottle. Double check that. They do, and it's a nice snug fit. The doors open nice and wide, so it'd be easy to load those bulky kid seats into the back here and attach them via the Isofix fittings on either seat. It's nice to see that we've got a middle seat foldy downy thingy with this car. Let's fold that down. Look at that, very extravagant. Pop that open, storage compartment there. And then we have more cup holders. Let's see if they fit my bottle. And it doesn't look like they will but they do, nice and snug. Top marks for the uh, cup holders in this car, very impressive. Let's fold that back up because we want to check out this cluster here. We get a couple of air vents. The design of these is not particularly special, not like those turbine design you get in the front, but pretty basic. And you get a couple of USB ports at the bottom. So yeah, the uh, rear passengers are very well catered for. So the space here is evidently comfortable for two adults. How about three? Let's hop into the middle, check that out. Oh, the back of that seat, very plasticky. That's really digging into my back. Thankfully, there's not too much of a transmission tunnel to straddle here, so I can stretch my legs out quite far. Short journeys, that'd be fine. Longer journeys, 
you'll be regretting this decision. That's it for the cabin, guys. Overall, I'm pretty impressed considering this vehicle's price point, but let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Okay, let's talk about trim levels now. Okay, guys, there's two trim levels available. The base spec Excite starts from £22,600 with the petrol version and £31,000 for the plug-in hybrid. And for that, you get these 18-inch Hurricane alloy wheels. Electrically adjustable and heated front seats. And the 360-degree parking system. Top rung exclusive variants start from £25,000 for petrol and £33,500 for plug-in hybrid. And highlights here include these LED bifunctional headlights with these gorgeous sequential indicators, this lovely panoramic sunroof, and a power operated tailgate. This car also comes with a range of optional accessories such as fabric and rubber floor mats, a 16 inch space saver wheel, and an electric tow bar. If you need a hand specking your perfect HS plug in hybrid, get in touch with our team via the link in the description. So guys, should you buy, lease or finance an MG HS plug-in hybrid? Well, there's a lot going for this bulky SUV. Firstly, it's more spacious and larger than other plug-in hybrids at this price point. By comparison, the Kia Sportage starts from around £26,700 and it's £5,000 more affordable than the Cougar plug-in hybrid. This means that it's not only suitable for families who want to reduce their fuel bills, but also company car buyers who want to slash that benefit in kind tax. The base spec Excite model is very well equipped. The exclusive trim level is not essential by any means unless you want the panoramic sunroof and the other nice to haves that it adds. Everyone I've taken out in the MG HS plug-in hybrid was very surprised by the comfortable and plush interior and that makes it great for long journeys coupled with that nice relaxing and smooth driving experience. There's also a decent amount of acceleration when you need it. It's not all sunshine and rainbows. Unfortunately, some motorists will find the drive on offer here too average and perhaps even too boring. It's not as dynamic as the Ford Cougar. The exterior appearance is a bit uninspiring. I wasn't a fan of the infotainment setup. It's too fiddly and laggy to use while on the go due to the lack of physical buttons, especially for the climate controls. And the engine, when it kicks in, sounds very coarse. There certainly needs to be more refinement when it comes to the powertrain. But overall, this is a very competent hybrid SUV. It's definitely worth a look, guys. There's a lot to like here, despite the shortcomings. To find and secure your perfect MG, give our vehicle specialists a call on the number below, or click the pop-out banner above to book a call at a time that's most convenient for you. And if you enjoyed today's in-depth review, guys, you can do all the YouTube stuff. That includes giving it a like, subscribing to the channel, and clicking the notification bell down there so you'll get notified when we upload future videos. That's it for today, though. Thanks for watching. Take care. Safe driving.